Hey YouTube, it's Weird Paul. I am celebrating 30 years since I released my second album on May 9th, 1988. So let's take a look back at the making of I Need a Pencil Sharpener. In October of 1987, I had released my first official album on cassette, In Case of Fire, Throw This In, the legal one. By the time that March rolled around, I realized that in three months, I was going to graduate and I was probably never going to see any of my classmates ever again. Four months later, I'd sold 30 copies of it, played a string of successful garage concerts, and even had it played on the radio. So even though I'd just released an album, I decided that it was in my best interest to get another one out as soon as possible. And I was especially ready to do so because two things had happened in January that had changed everything. On January 22nd, my parents had bought us a Casio keyboard, the MT520 model. So now, not only did I have access to a lot of keyboard and piano sounds, I also had a way of playing percussion thanks to the drum pads. No more banging on mom's pots and pans. A week later, on January 30th, my dad went to Radio Shack and bought me this realistic stereo mixer. Now I could easily add more tracks to one song. I didn't even have to sing and play guitar at the same time anymore. But if you made one mistake, you'd have to start the song all the way over from the beginning. So this was the first time that I did not record the songs in order on the album. In the past, I'd recorded them in order directly on the master tape. I started the album out with the sound of me scanning my radio for a listenable station, followed by a scream, which was actually my little brother. That was my commentary on the state of radio in 1988. The first song on the album was the skate rock anthem, Knock People Over, and it was one of the last songs that I recorded. I had written the song on April 17th, and it was inspired by me witnessing everyone at my church trying to lead through the same doors at the same time. I wrote the song in about 10 minutes, and I double-tracked my voice so it would sound like a gang yelling. Knock people over! I actually skipped school on May 2nd, just to record the song. The second song on the album was You're Wrong, which I'd previously recorded on the unreleased 1986 album In Case of Fire Throw This In, but this was a new recording I'd done on April 23rd. The third song had the same number of chords in it as its track number. I'd written Pizza Man spontaneously on February 26th, 1988. I was having a private concert for some of my friends in my family's living room, and my dad had ordered pizza for these real weird Paul fans. When the pizza delivery man arrived, everyone went nuts. They wanted him to come in for the concert. Come on in! Come on in! Yeah! 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 yeah. yeah. Play the pizza yeah. man song! <laughs> pizza man! 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 He didn't, but I wrote the song right then and there. And when I recorded it, I kind of ripped off the exploited song, SPG. Pizza Man Fast Destruction! Pizza Man Fast Corruption! Screw the Pizza Man! One of the first songs that I wrote for the album was the now classic My Head's on Fire. I was in my bedroom playing my guitar around 7 p.m. on February 10th, 1988. I decided that I wanted to write a Ramon style song, and I came up with the music. Here's the original lyrics that I wrote, and some are erased underneath, but I don't remember what I changed. The song does have what was probably my first decent guitar solo. And I made a music video for it later in May 1989. The fifth song was called Asking God for Gum. In early 1988, I was in chemistry class, and my lab partner, Eric, told me that I could call him God. So I did. One day, someone asked Eric for some gum. I said, ha, you're asking God for gum. And I wrote the song a few months later. And when I recorded it on April 21st, I used this little Lucky Charms mini keyboard. Then I added on the song Looking for Live Legend, which I originally recorded on the 1987 unreleased cassette The World According to Petrosky. 
When I started working on the album in March of 1988, I didn't have a lot of new songs. So one thing I did was go and raid my 1985 creative writing journal from my sophomore year of high school. The next two songs came out of this journal. Cheech and Chong was a limerick that I had to write as an assignment in December 1985. I got an A+, even though I mentioned lewds, cocaine, and marijuana. Cheech and Chong are really cool dudes, but they seem to be always on birds. The next track, Harangue, was also from my creative writing journal, and I had written it in December. It was a long stream of consciousness speech that made little sense. I took the title from a review I'd seen in Rolling Stone of the Dee Dee Ramone composition, Eat That Rat. Some dudes look cool in shades. When you're cruising in your automobile and you see a fire hydrant, you stop? I would just keep going, but I would count it. Track number nine, Shit Eating Grin, was one of the last songs I recorded on May 4th. It's a fast punk rock song, and from looking at the lyric sheet, I see that there was a pretty lousy verse that I left out. Look at that! Next, I re-recorded the song, I'm a Guitar, which I originally recorded on the unreleased 1986 cassette, Beaten with the Ugly Stick. This was the first song that I'd ever written on guitar on October 12th, 1985. And when I re-recorded it, I had to recreate the strange tuning, which had two of the strings tuned to C-sharp. Forced Food Deliveries was written in January after I'd seen the title on a blackboard in school. I described it as my Elvis Costello song. The next track was the strange narrative Spaghetti Western, which I'd also written in creative writing class. The first Indian passed it to the second, who vomited into it. The second then placed it on Texas head. Another song where I found the title in school was Messed Up and Stupid. It was something I heard in a teen crisis film that they'd shown in the auditorium. This song was originally called Shit Eating Grin, but that didn't work out, so that became its own song. I used the realistic electronic reverb that I'd gotten in 1986 to give the guitar a different sound. Track number 14, Bronchitis, was inspired by my friend Brandon, who'd been off school sick for three days. I thought it would be funny to have a song with no vocals, only coughing. But I was sick when I recorded it, and after two takes, I was feeling bad. The next song, Your Face, was based on a song I'd played in a home video on February 11th, 1986. I just fleshed it out a little. And now for a new song I just wrote called Your Face. Your face doesn't look like a man. And the last song on side one was an extended version of Blackout, the eight second song that had appeared on my first released album. This extended version ran almost twice as long, 15 seconds. This then became a tradition of me doing a new version of Blackout on every album that I put out. That's halfway through the album. And as I was working on it, I was trying to come up with a title for it. I knew that the title had to be something funny. At lunch one day, my friend Jason and I started making a list of possible titles. I didn't use any of these, though a few later became lyrics, or even songs. Eventually, I came upon the idea of having a cover where pencils were sticking out of my face. I'd call it, I Need a Pencil Sharpener. I had my mom take the photo. This was before Photoshop, so I used scotch tape to hold pencils to my fingers. The ones in my mouth, nose, and ears were just stuck in. I started off side two of the album with a new recording of the Hacky Sack Rap, which had earlier been recorded for my unreleased 1986 album, In Case of Fire, Throw This In. The 18th song on the album was Eighth Grader Hangs Himself. About a week after we got that Casio Tone keyboard, my sister came home and told us that a boy who had gone to her school had hung himself. I started playing the keyboard, and this really sad music just started flowing out. I wrote down all the settings so that I could record the instrumental a few months later. Back in February, I'd sneak a small tape recorder into school. I'd hide the headphones in my long hair, and the teachers didn't even know I was listening to it. 
I found out that the inside of my locker sounded good if you sang into the vents from the outside. On February 28th, I wrote a song called This Is My Locker, and I told my friends to come to locker C-112 in Building 4 before homeroom. My friends Jason, Ray, Brandon, Tony, and Drew all showed up, and we sang the song loudly into my locker. This is my locker, this is my locker, I live in And Brandon had actually written me some lyrics that ended up being the next song on the album. It's a Choice was supposed to be played very fast, and I wrote some real punk rock music to go with it that was inspired by the Sex Pistols. This was also the first Weird Paul song ever that had bass in the song, played by my friend Chris Hout. So it's a choice, it's up to you. The next track on the album was recorded long before the rest of it, on October 12th, 1985. The Day I Got My Guitar is an actual recording of my dad trying to hook it up to an amp. I was trying to get the electric guitar to play. This is dad, by the way, doing this. You hear the joy, the pain, the sorrow, the reality. You are there. The next song was Backyard Barbecue Downtown. The lyrics were written by my friend Mark Graham in chemistry class back in November, and then I wrote the music. Mark came over my house on May 5th and did the bass and backing vocals on this and two other songs. I'm having a backyard barbecue downtown. Tracks 23 and 24 were both re-recordings of earlier songs. Call Paul had originally been on 1987's The World According to Petrosky, and Monster Man Tattoos was the song my sister and I had recorded on our album Othello, also in 1987. That song's title came from an episode of the TV show Perfect Strangers, where Balky got some Monster Man tattoos out of a box of cereal, and Cousin Larry wanted to give them to a kid instead. I like my Monster Man tattoos. I like them a lot. In late January, I'd been walking back from the cafeteria with a bunch of my friends when we saw a bunch of nachos and cheese just laying on the ground. I said, those poor nachos just thrown out on the street with no home. Someone said, in Spanish, that would be Nacho Sin Casa. So I wrote that down, and then a demo of Nacho Sin Casa was the first thing I ever recorded using the realistic mixer that my dad had bought me. Nacho Sin Casa. This was another song that my friend Mark played bass on when we recorded the final version for the album. The lyrics for track 26, The Library is Mean, were written by my sister, and here's the paper that she gave me in March of 1988. As I was nearing completion of the album, my friend Mark told me to leave room for the Mike Brady song. When Mark came over to my house on May 5th, he brought with him lyrics that he'd written about the father on the TV show The Brady Bunch. He'd written it to the tune of the Sex Pistols song, God Save the Queen. So, those were the chords we used when we recorded it, with him on bass and backing vocals. That night, I videotaped an episode of the show and added in some dialogue. And to make it even crazier, I played the warped Willie Nelson guitar. The only time I ever played it while it was warped. My friend Jason, who also worked as my roadie, wanted to write a song together. So we wrote, You're a Bum. He wrote the riff and played rhythm guitar, and I wrote the lyrics and played the leads. I remember that I had to cut this song down and make it shorter, because the tape was filling up fast. I added on a re-recording of the very short song, School, from my 1987 unreleased tape, The World According to Petrosky, and then the 30th track was a parody of the Eric Clapton song, Cocaine, called Sam Bain. Sam Bain was a kid in my graduating class. My friends Kurt and Drew came over. We were just jamming when Drew started singing Sam Bain. Kurt played percussion on this little drum that I had when I was a kid and on the Oral Roberts commemorative tray. Made a great symbol. Later that summer, I remember going into the Foodland grocery store where Sam worked, with my guitar, to serenade him. 
It was the beginning of May, and I had to get the last couple songs done fast. The song Breaking Bass Guitar was inspired by an actual event in the 70s, when Dee Dee Ramone was so nervous at his show, he actually stepped on his bass guitar and somehow broke the neck. I had written it back on February 11th. I wrote the lyrics in study hall, and then wrote the music that night, which I based on the Ramone song Susie is a Headbanger. There's a funny intro with my friend Mark, but the sound that you hear is actually us breaking a piece of styrofoam. You broke my bass! The track ends with a bass solo called Dude by my friend Chris Hout. Twenty years later, in 2008, Chris came back and recorded another bass solo called Redude on my album As Heard in My Dreams. The last and 32nd song on the album was Let Me See That Knife. My friend Matt Scanlon would use a pen knife to cut a section off of the lunchtime milk carton each day, and then he'd drink the milk out of the new opening. He called it Milk with Matt. One day, as he was cutting one of the corners off of the bottom of the milk carton, somebody said, let me see that knife when you're done with it. That inspired me to write this depressing song, and I guess it was partly inspired by that eighth grader who'd hung himself. It's sort of a grunge song, which is how my band plays it now. All the songs were recorded, and I worked quickly to figure out the lengths, put them in an order, write up the credits, get the photos reprinted, and dub the tapes. I released the tape on May 9, 1988, and I hung ads like this one in a couple of my classes. Pretty amazing, especially considering there was a bad word right on it. The first 20 copies I sold came with a free piece of Tiger Taffy, a candy that my mom had bought at Woolworths, and that I've never seen or heard of since. In my AP Lit journal, I wrote that I'd sold 17 copies in the first 15 days. It was already more popular than my first album from 1987. I had gained the respect of my classmates, or at least in most cases, no one bullied me or messed with me anymore. Other than two kids who decided one day in world cultures to throw my new cassettes back and forth over my head, monkey in the middle style. So lame. And at least in the case of the one who friend requested me on Facebook, still lame. Here's the list of all the people in my school that bought a copy of the album. Eventually, I sold 91 copies, including one to John S. Hall of the band King Missile in 1990. I sent the tape to WVCS, the station that had played my first tape, and they played this one, too. Then I sent it to WRCT at Carnegie Mellon University, and they started playing me on that station also. And right now we're going to hear from a new local guy. His name is Paul Off the Wall Petrosky, and he sent us a tape about a week ago. It's called I Need a Pencil Sharpener. We're going to hear a couple tunes. Uh, this is the latest local release, I think, that we have, right? On August 19th, 1988, I received my official copyright for I Need a Pencil Sharpener that I paid $10 to get. I now had two copyrighted albums, and I wasn't even 18 yet, and I still hadn't played a real gig. I hope that you enjoyed the look back at the making of my second album, I Need a Pencil Sharpener, on its 30th anniversary. And if you did, don't forget to click on that like button down below. I'll see you soon with more memories. Thanks, YouTube. Knock people over, we're gonna knock people over.